God is dead. The time has come to accept it. This sentence from Nietzsche has echoed through the corridors of time, sparking debates, discussions, and a myriad of interpretations. But what did Nietzsche truly mean by this bold proclamation? At its core, Nietzsche wasn't making a theological assertion about the literal death of a deity. Instead, he was commenting on a profound cultural and philosophical shift. The Enlightenment era, with its emphasis on reason, science, and individualism, had begun to erode the traditional foundations of religious belief in Western society. As a result, Nietzsche observed that the moral and ethical anchors provided by religion, especially Christianity, were losing their grip on the collective consciousness. By declaring God is dead, Nietzsche was highlighting the potential dangers of this shift. Without the moral compass that religion once provided, he feared society might plunge into nihilism, a belief that life is devoid of intrinsic meaning or value. This could lead to a moral vacuum, where societal norms and values become unmoored and arbitrary. However, Nietzsche also saw a silver lining. The death of God, in his view, presented an opportunity for individuals to rise above traditional beliefs and carve out their own moral and philosophical paths. This idea is encapsulated in his concept of the Ubermensch, or Overman, an individual who transcends traditional values to create their own. God is dead is not just a statement, but a reflection on the changing tides of belief. The challenges of a world without established moral certainties and the potential for new, individualized paths of meaning. However, those who study the topic of the Anunnaki, ancient civilizations, and the visits from those who came from the skies to Earth, must view this statement with different shades than those who only see it from a social, moral, and cultural standpoint. This video is a bit different from others on the channel. I usually cover various topics, correlations, and diverse explanations. Thus, the videos tend to be rich in details, offering different nuances and insights to stimulate and allow for study and reflection. But this video is different. It's shorter and more concise. If it were in the usual style, given the vast range of perspectives, this video would be lengthy. So, the idea is different. I aim to provide you with correlations and explanations that will enable your study and reflection. But I won't delve into various paths. I anticipate that by the time of its release, we'll have over 100,000 subscribers, and that's a cause for celebration. I want to take this opportunity in the video to thank you for being here and for being a part of my life and this channel. Knowing that you are here is very important to me. Most viewers of this channel are between 35 and 65 years old. 75% of those who watch the videos on this channel fall within this age range between 35 and 65 years old. Of these, approximately 50% are between 35 and 55 years old. There are no kids here. And many of us, like myself, have our own children. Although the channel has around 100,000 subscribers, the channel's data show that we currently have about 1 million unique users on the channel, with almost 500,000 being recurring viewers. So, knowing that the potential audience of this channel ranges between 500,000 and 1 million people, I understand the responsibility I have. I know what the opening sentence of the video can lead to. The phrase, God is dead, is extremely impactful, but I believe we should approach this statement and fact with a discerning mind and an open perspective. At the end of the video, and I hope you stay with me until then, you will understand that this is not a statement that should lead us to atheism from my point of view. We need to comprehend, study, and analyze the end of an era. 
That's why this video is shorter when compared to the diversity of topics and the seriousness of its content, but it is incredibly impactful. We're not children anymore. The times have come. Many of us would lie in our beds at night, looking up at the sky, thanking for the day that passed, praising the glories and blessings of the Lord, the Almighty, hoping He would bless our lives. We needed to express gratitude and seek His blessings. This practice has spanned millennia and generations. This habit has shaped many of our lives. And perhaps that's why the phrase, God is dead, is so shocking. It directly challenges something very precious. Family, inherited habits, education, morality, and what it means to be a good person. Many of us face significant inner turmoil when we start questioning the values passed down from our parents, educators, schools, and society at large. This profound conflict is deeply distressing. And I confess to you, I can say it loud and clear, for a simple reason, I've experienced this conflict. Currently, by estimates, the number of monotheists on the planet is just over 4 billion. Out of nearly 8 billion people, we have slightly more than 50% of the population believing in one God, thus classified as monotheists. Of these about 4 billion monotheists, Christianity and Islam are almost tied in numbers. Based on the data I've seen, Judaism has around 15 million followers, while Islam and Christianity are in the billions. Considering the various beliefs and customs, if a high percentage of each of these religious groups is sufficiently extremist in their beliefs, we already have enough fuel for another religious war with massive numbers, as we've seen throughout world history. Zechariah Sitchin's Anunnaki theory, built from his books and studies, and best illustrated in The Lost Book of Enki, has been adapted into film format on this channel. It offers a detailed sequence of events that helps us understand our past. However, Sitchin's narrative shouldn't be the only one we delve into, nor should it become a sort of new religion, making us feel at ease, thinking we now grasp all past events. To truly understand and study what transpired, we need much more than this. This is why Nietzsche's profound statement holds particular relevance in our lives. Seeking the truth requires more than just stepping through one door of perception and merely entering the next. The matrix consists of many doors. We have a long journey ahead to fully grasp the rules of this game in which we're immersed in this life, this universe, this dimension. Nietzsche's philosophy, especially his idea of the hammer, is particularly relevant here. Nietzsche often spoke of the philosopher with a hammer, an image that represents the act of challenging and testing long-held beliefs, much like one would tap on objects to see if they are hollow or solid. This hammer is not a tool of destruction, but of examination. It's about questioning the idols of our time, the beliefs and systems we hold dear, to see if they stand up to scrutiny. Now, let's consider the Anunnaki studies, especially as presented by Zechariah Sitchin. For many, this has become a new form of understanding, a new narrative that explains our past and our connection to the cosmos. But like all beliefs, it too can become an idol, a fixed idea that we don't question, that we take as absolute truth. Using Nietzsche's hammer, we should tap on this idol of the Anunnaki narrative. Not to dismiss it, but to understand it better, to see where it is solid and where it might be hollow. Just as Nietzsche encouraged us to question traditional religious beliefs, we must also question newer ones, no matter how compelling they might be. The danger lies not in the belief itself, but in holding on to it dogmatically, without questioning, without using our hammer. Whether it's the traditional beliefs of monotheistic religions or the newer narratives of ancient astronauts, all should be subject to scrutiny. In this age, where over half the world's population believes in a single deity and where ancient narratives are being revived and reinterpreted, the potential for conflict is immense. But Nietzsche's hammer offers a way out. It encourages dialogue, 
understanding, and most importantly, self-reflection. In this regard, in this video, we'll lay out a logical path towards a deeper understanding of the topic. To achieve this, I won't delve into every possible interpretation and direction. We'll follow a single line of thought, ensuring clarity and precision on the matter. This video has a more straightforward intent. You can share it with friends and family, and anyone with the curiosity and insight to challenge their beliefs and seek a new direction. In our quest for understanding, we often turn to science, the beacon of reason and logic. Yet traditional science remains baffled when it comes to explaining the sudden emergence of modern man. How did we, as a species, leap from being mere nomadic hunter-gatherers to architects of grand civilizations in what seems like a blink of an eye in the vast timeline of Earth? The annals of archaeology and history provide us with tantalizing clues. From the dusty plains and rugged terrains where our ancestors once roamed in search of sustenance, we witnessed a transformation that is nothing short of miraculous. Suddenly, there were bustling cities with intricate trade networks, established legal systems, educational institutions, and a structured taxation system. Medicine, once limited to rudimentary herbs and chants, evolved into a sophisticated practice with dedicated healers, remedies, and medical care. The dawn of agriculture and livestock farming marked a departure from our nomadic roots, ensuring a steady supply of food and resources. But perhaps the most profound change was in the realm of the intangible. Religion, with its rituals, myths, and deities, began to shape the moral and ethical fabric of these early societies. Libraries, those treasure troves of knowledge, sprang up, preserving the wisdom of the ages. And then there was writing. The Sumerians gifted humanity with one of its most potent tools. Through cuneiform inscriptions, they chronicled their tales, laws, and discoveries, setting the stage for the myriad of scripts and languages that would follow. Yet one can't help but wonder, what sparked this rapid evolution? Was it merely a natural progression, or were there external influences at play? When we shift our gaze to the realm of biology, genetics, and Darwin's theory of evolution, the plot thickens. The timeline for the rapid ascent to Homo sapiens, as proposed by conventional wisdom, is astoundingly brief. Evolution, as we understand it, is a slow, gradual process shaped by countless generations of natural selection. Yet, the leap from our primitive ancestors to the sophisticated, thinking beings we are today seems to defy this gradualism. Darwinian evolution suggests that species evolve over long periods, adapting to their environments through minute changes in their genetic makeup. But the time frame in which humans underwent monumental shifts in cognitive abilities, physical attributes, and societal structures is, by evolutionary standards, a mere heartbeat. How did we, in such a short span, develop complex linguistic abilities, artistic expression, and the capacity to ponder our very existence? As civilizations emerged from the shadows of prehistory, a recurring motif becomes evident, the central role of deity worship. From the sprawling river valleys of Mesopotamia to the majestic pyramids of Egypt, the reverence and adoration of gods have been an intrinsic part of our collective narrative. It's fascinating to observe that, regardless of geographical location or cultural differences, early civilizations were invariably anchored by their spiritual beliefs. Temples, often grandiose and architecturally magnificent, dominated city skylines. Priests and spiritual leaders held positions of immense power and influence, often rivaling or even surpassing kings and rulers. Rituals, ceremonies, and festivals dedicated to the gods punctuated the daily lives of these ancient peoples, providing both a sense of purpose and a connection to the divine. But why this universal inclination towards the divine? Was it merely a means to explain the inexplicable? 
to attribute natural phenomena and life's uncertainties to higher powers? Or was there a deeper, perhaps even tangible connection between these ancient civilizations and the gods they revered? As we sift through the sands of time, we uncover artifacts, scriptures, and inscriptions that hint at a relationship that goes beyond mere worship. Tales of gods descending from the skies, of celestial chariots and otherworldly beings, are not confined to a single culture but echo across continents. These narratives, eerily consistent in their descriptions, challenge our conventional understanding of history. In the light of such revelations, one can't help but ponder. Were these deities mere figments of our ancestors' imaginations, symbolic representations of natural forces? Or were they, perhaps, visitors from realms beyond our understanding, beings with knowledge and technology that seemed divine to our fledgling civilizations? Those who have been following this channel for a while, or have watched other videos, know that I advocate for the idea that we should explore life symbolically, physically, and spiritually, from every angle and in all its various shades. And that's why this topic is so captivating. But if we look at it, and we'll do that now, from a physical and bodily perspective, understanding these beings as flesh and bone creatures, what will we find? Ancient civilizations, regardless of their geographical locations or cultural nuances, shared a common thread. Polytheism. The reverence for not just one, but multiple deities was a hallmark of their spiritual and societal structures. Consider the pantheon of gods in ancient Greece. The mighty Zeus, ruling the skies with his thunderbolts. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Poseidon, the tempestuous ruler of the seas. Each deity had its domain, its narrative, and its dedicated followers. In Rome, a civilization known for its vast empire and architectural marvels, the gods were central to daily life. Jupiter, Mars, Venus. These names were invoked for protection, prosperity, and guidance. Venture further east, and the tales of the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Assyrians unfold. Their pantheon was vast and intricate, with gods like Anu, Enlil, and Inanna playing pivotal roles in creation myths, epic battles, and tales of divine intervention. Africa, with its rich tapestry of tribes and traditions, revered a plethora of gods, each representing natural elements, ancestral spirits, and moral virtues. The Indian subcontinent, home to one of the world's oldest civilizations, the Indus Valley, had its own myriad of deities. Later, as Vedic traditions took root, gods like Indra, Agni, and Varuna became central figures in rituals and scriptures. But what's truly fascinating is not just the sheer number of gods these civilizations revered, but the profound impact these deities had on their societal evolution. Every major achievement, be it architectural wonders, groundbreaking inventions, or philosophical breakthroughs, was attributed to the divine. The gods weren't distant, abstract entities. They were intimately involved in the daily affairs of these ancient peoples. The construction of the majestic pyramids of Egypt? A tribute to the gods. The intricate water systems of the Indus Valley, bestowed upon them by divine knowledge. The poetic verses of the Rigveda in ancient India, hymns sung in praise of the gods. The famed hanging gardens of Babylon, a testament to divine inspiration. Every corner of the ancient world, from the Americas to the Far East, echoed with tales of gods bestowing knowledge, guiding rulers, and shaping destinies. In the grand mosaic of human history, these tales of gods and their profound influence on ancient civilizations form a central piece. They challenge our modern sensibilities, urging us to look beyond the confines of conventional history. For in these tales, in the whispered prayers of our ancestors and the monumental temples they erected, lies a truth. A truth that speaks of a time when heaven and earth were intimately intertwined, when gods and men shared destinies and dreams. 
In previous videos, we've explored the rich tapestry of deities that were revered in the very regions where Yahweh's worship later flourished. The ancient Near East was a melting pot of spiritual beliefs, each civilization contributing its unique threads to the weave. In Babylon, for instance, amidst a pantheon of gods and goddesses, one deity began to overshadow the rest, Marduk. Similarly, in the sun-drenched lands of Egypt, a revolution in religious thought was underway. The sun god Ra, with his falcon head and sun disk, was not content being one among many. He proclaimed himself the supreme deity, merging with another god, Amun, to become Amun-Ra. This fusion not only solidified his position as the king of gods, but also left an indelible mark on our spiritual lexicon. The term Amen, often uttered at the end of prayers, is a testament to Amun-Ra's enduring legacy. Yet, what's truly fascinating is the underlying narrative that threads through these ancient civilizations. There's a recurring theme, a shared belief that in the distant past, it was not humans but gods who walked the earth. These celestial beings, with their immense power and knowledge, were not mere spectators. They were active participants, shaping the course of human history. From the Sumerian tales of the Anunnaki to the Greek epics of gods meddling in mortal affairs, this belief is consistent. Gods created, guided, and sometimes even fathered humans. This narrative, while varied in its details, is a cornerstone of mythologies worldwide. But then a profound shift occurred. Amidst this polytheistic backdrop, voices began to rise, proclaiming the supremacy of a singular deity. Yahweh, initially one among the Canaanite gods, began to be revered as the one true God by the Israelites. But what catalyzed this transition? Was it a divine revelation, as scriptures suggest, or a socio-political evolution, where consolidating power under one deity provided stability and unity? It's crucial to note that while the concept of a singular god emerged in various cultures, the identity of this deity varied. For the Israelites, it was Yahweh. For the Babylonians, Marduk. And for the Egyptians, Amun-Ra. This divergence raises intriguing questions. Were these civilizations, in their quest for spiritual clarity, converging on a universal truth? Or were they crafting their unique interpretations of divine encounters, each culture molding the divine in its image? Now, let's focus our attention on something very intriguing. The concept of a central father god. In the sacred hymns of the Vedas, the ancient scriptures of Hinduism, we find mention of Dyaus Pita. Translated, it means Sky Father a deity who was revered as a central figure in the early Vedic pantheon. This god wasn't just confined to the Indian subcontinent. Remarkably, echoes of Dios Pita can be heard in the annals of ancient Greece, in the form of Zeus Potter. Zeus, the king of gods, who ruled from Mount Olympus, shares striking similarities with Dios Pita, not just in name but also in function and attributes. Venture further west, and the narrative continues in ancient Rome. Here, the chief deity, the ruler of the heavens, was known as Jupiter. The etymological roots of Jupiter trace back to Dupater, again resonating with the Vedic Diospita and the Greek Zeuspater. This linguistic and mythological consistency across diverse cultures is nothing short of astounding. It suggests a shared understanding a common thread of belief that transcended geographical boundaries and cultural nuances. But as we peel back the layers of history, a pressing question emerges. Who truly hides behind the mask of the singular god? Is it a confluence of various deities from different cultures, each contributing to the mosaic of the one god? Or did one deity over time overshadow the rest, consolidating power and reverence? In trying to better understand the events of our past, 
we're often shrouded in a mist of uncertainty. It's not just the passage of time and the lingering questions, it's the inconsistencies that arise from study. This is because, upon examining the scriptures, Yahweh cannot be Marduk, and Marduk likely isn't Zeus. In this context, we must also remember Anu, the greatest of all the Anunnaki gods. When pondering this, I often see people coming to this channel and consistently mentioning that the Anunnaki themselves believed in a singular god. However, it's essential to clarify as mentioned in other videos. If we take Zechariah Sitchin's theory as the absolute truth, then indeed we have a singular god, the father of all things, according to Sitchin's theory. And this god is none other than Yahweh, which I vehemently disagree with, for reasons discussed in other videos and the paths my own research has taken me. And when we delve into history itself and archaeological studies, we find something quite intriguing. The Anunnaki never stated in the original myths that they held any beliefs. And the reason for this is quite simple. The Anunnaki are the gods worshipped by the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Assyrians who left their mythological records on tablets. It's like in Greece. The Greeks never said their gods had beliefs. If you're feeling confused, take heart. It means you're grasping the complexity of the topic. I must confess, as we tread this path of discovery, I harbor my own reservations and beliefs. While the tales of Dios Pita, Zeus Pater and Jupiter are compelling, I find myself gravitating towards the concept of a singular, ineffable deity. Not the god of scriptures or temples, but the All as described in the Hermetic Principles by Hermes Trismegistus. This god is beyond comprehension, beyond definition, existing in everything and nothing, a cosmic force that binds the universe. To truly grasp the essence of this deity, one must embark on a profound journey of knowledge and introspection. The events of our distant past, shrouded in myths and legends, hold the keys to our present and the map to our future. It's a quest that demands dedication, for in understanding our past, we chart the course for our future. In the words of the philosopher Nietzsche, God is dead. For me, it's not a proclamation of atheism, it's a call to introspection. We, with our relentless pursuit of logic and reason, have shattered the idols of old, wielding Nietzsche's metaphorical hammer. Now, amidst the fragments of our broken statue, we must piece together the narrative of our past to comprehend our future. For, as the Hermetic Principles state, as above, so below. The macrocosm reflects the microcosm, and in understanding one, we unravel the other.